I start? Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, first of all, yeah, as Ognian told you, my name is Esteban. I will be working with Ognian as a postdoc here, and I'm very happy to finally uh, be in Brussels. I gave a very similar talk to the one I'm going to give today uh, in December last year. It was the beginning of this. Uh, we were in the middle of finishing this paper that I'm going to talk about now. And this paper is about the interface between gravity and quantum mechanics. And in particular, it has to do with the notion of events and with the notion of uh, time dilation and time evolution in um, situations where we have some sort of superposition of metrics. So as you know, the metric of space-time is, is the thing that tells us how rulers work and how clocks work. And it's extremely important to even state the dynamical laws of physics and to, to even start talking about uh, building up a theory and so on. It's something we take for granted. But there are some hints that, that this notion uh, has to be uh, replaced by something more general when one thinks about very simple situations like, like, for example, putting a piece of lead in a quantum superposition of two positions, right? We know that this piece of lead sources the gravitational field, which is basically the metric. And if, we, if you put it in a superposition of two positions, then this metric is no longer um, a fixed uh, thing of space-time, which is the thing we're used to, to, to kind of state our theories and, and uh, to define them. So, uh, so this work is an attempt to um, start thinking about what kind of notions should be replaced or what kind of notions remain, perhaps this is more important, um, in situations like the one I was talking about, where you have uh, superposition of masses or where you have uh, I don't know, superposition of maybe energies or things like that, that lead to a non-definite metric field. How can we do physics in such situations? How can we um, understand time evolution, understand, I don't know, the Schrodinger equation, or even um, way more basic notions that, uh, like the notion of an event, right? An event is understood maybe mathematically as a point in a manifold. I don't know. How long do I have? I'm, I'm going pretty... Uh, Post, so uh, okay, okay. So I, I'll I'll take it. Uh, please interrupt me uh, if something is not clear. Um, so we'll talk about this uh, notion of events as as something that happens to a physical system, not merely as a mathematical construction, but but something that goes on in nature as a matter of introduction. And I will talk about the localization of events, how, how they are connected, say, with each other, and uh, trying to, to stress the importance of the metric in these ideas. And then afterwards, I will, uh, I will give you a very simple kind of thought experiment, a very simple situation that one can think in, in the laboratory that leads to a metric which is indefinite and that leads to problems f um, for defining what we mean by, by, by the passing of time, for example, or uh, all, all problems uh, related to the fact that we don't have a fixed uh, space-time distance, say, so to speak. And then I will introduce um, some framework that can deal with some aspects of, of this problem. And this is what the, what the work is about. So first of all, so these are slides prepared for a conference in causality and so on. And, and so, so this, uh, all of the talks contain diagrams of this type, or almost all. And diagrams of this type mean things that happen to physical systems in the boxes, right? So, so we have boxes, we have operations performed on physical systems, like maybe technically speaking, CP maps happening on a quantum system. And then these operations are wired together in such a way that one can um, know whether one of these operations can affect the other one, and so on. And we call this events. Each, uh, whenever a thing happens in one of these boxes, we say the event happened. I, I measure the spin and I find it up, and this is an event. And uh, 
And this is pretty much the notion of event that I will be talking about. And I will be talking about more in kind of this context, where, where you have space and time, the wires and the boxes are, are somehow an abstraction, maybe, to, to this picture, where events are represented again by something that happens to a system, but we somehow locate them or map them in something that we call space-time. And then we have the notion of a light cone, and based on this notion, we can decide whether uh, two events can causally influence each other. For example, C can causally influence D, because D is inside the light cone of C. But A cannot influence C, because C is just outside of the light cone of, um, of A. And very importantly, this, of course, is extremely important if we want to calculate probabilities for stuff to happen. If you want to calculate um, outcomes of experiments, this is one of the most basic things we start up with. And this will constrain the sort of, for example, uh, distribution of outcomes that we will have. More generally, the, the mere notion of how the events are relatively localized uh, with respect to each other has to do with the space-time metric. If, if, the, if the metric is, say, all the curves are space-like from going here to here, this means A cannot influence C. It can even help us to define what we mean by an event. For example, we have a word line, we have an observer that is moving in space-time along this trajectory, and this observer has a clock. He or she defines the event A by the time measured by the clock and something else probably happening. And then the event B can be defined, OK, I go along this trajectory and I wait for the clock to measure some other time. And crucially, whatever the clock measures is determined by the metric of space-time. So if we don't have a fixed metric, we don't know whether events are um, related spatially or, or time-like to each other. And we don't know how to define events in this way by following um, the ticking of a clock along a curve. And by events, again, I, I, I mean not only abstract mathematical points, but actually stuff that is happening. For example, a system interacting with an ancilla here when the clock measures this, and the, the same thing happening uh, at a later time. So, so this, is, um, this is kind of the introduction of, of uh, why having a fixed space and metric is important to define the relative localization of events. Now I will talk about briefly uh, just a simple example of a situation that can lead to a metric which is not definite. And this simple example has to do with one of the most basic things that we do normally in physics, which is me measuring time. No? When we measure time, we use a clock. And, um, and this clock has some energy. No? Here I'm modeling the clock by the simplest thing you can, uh, you can imagine, namely some qubit, some, some system with two energy levels. And crucially, if this system is, is uh, supposed to serve as a clock, this system has to be in a superposition state of its own Hamiltonian. Because if it's in the, say, ground state or, or in, a fixed, uh, in a state of fixed energy, then obviously the clock will not, uh, will not change. And if it will not change, we, we will not be able to use it as something that measures time. <coughs> how accurate is this guy? It depends on how quick it uh, undergoes a transition between this state, which has a plus here, to the orthogonal state, which we can distinguish perfectly from it. And we can say, OK, with certainty, one second has passed. So we need to have a minus here. And how fast this uh, transition happens has to do with the energy gap of the clock. The bigger the energy gap, the faster the clock uh, state becomes orthogonal to the initial state, and the more precise we can define the passing of time. And this is very important. This is, this is something that has to do merely with quantum mechanics. But then we know that not only quantum mechanics uh, plays a significant role in physics, but also uh, relativity, right? General relativity in particular. And we know that there is a phenomenon called gravitational time dilation, by which a clock, which is uh, sitting near, near to a mass, runs slower relative to the same clock sitting somewhere where the mass is not, is not nearby, right? 
So why is this important in this context? Suppose this clock is extremely accurate. Suppose this clock um, has an energy gap such that so large that we can measure time, that we can chop the timeline in, in a very, very thinly. And this means that uh, we will reach a level of accuracy where the gravitational influence of these energy levels will become non negligible. In particular, for a guy who is sitting, I don't know, certain distance with respect to the clock, the very accurate clock. And then we can ask the question, how would a clock sitting nearby the very accurate clock tick in the presence of that clock? So first of all, if, we, if, if this clock had a fixed energy, which it cannot because it's a clock, if it had an energy E0, then this clock would tick with a time dilation corresponding to the, to the gravitational field that has a mass E0 over C squared, right? To the first approximation in Newtonian, uh, in Newtonian gravity. On the other hand, if this clock had an energy E1, it would tick slower. It would tick, tick slower because uh, E1 is greater than E0, and it's much greater than E0 in our approximation. But the point is that this clock is neither in E0 nor in E1, but in a superposition between E0 and E1, because we need it, we need it to be like that in order for it to work as a clock. Therefore, there is a superposition, or, or there is an uncertainty in the gravitational field that this object is sourcing. It, and its superposition is uh, proportional to the energy gap uh, between, the, between the levels. This means that this clock will not know how to tick. It will not know, it, it will tick in some, some sort of super, superposition of time dilation. One amplitude being uh, corresponding to E0 and the other amplitude corresponding to E1. So if one puts these two things together, one uh, that has to do with general relativity and the other that has to do with um, quantum mechanics, one can see that uh, there is a trade-off between the accuracy with which we can measure time with this clock and uh, the time dilation or the uncertainty in time dilation that this clock will experience. If we don't want this clock to experience any uncertainty in time dilation, what we have to do is decrease the energy gap. But the price we pay if we do that is that this clock will become less, accurately, less accurate. So, so if we want to measure time very accurately here, the price we pay is that the accuracy with which we can measure time here decreases. So this is an example of, of the type of phenomena or type of uh, limitations for our usual notions of uh, measuring time um, that has to do with the fact that we don't have a fixed metric of space-time. A bit. Could you, could, you, could you mention why the situation is different in classical why would I not make some similar argument for classical clocks? Um, so classical clocks will not lead to a superposition of, of gravitational fields. They will, they will, of course, affect the gravitational field. And, uh, and you will have to take this into account if you want to measure time. But the gravitational field will always be fixed. It will always be... It will never be in a state of superposition with, with some uncertainty. But isn't it the case that in classical you can even imagine like infinitely light clocks, very light, that cannot actually like test particles and test clocks that are really not going to affect the gravitational field? So is it not possible to imagine? Is that not, like I have the feeling that here maybe H bar is really kind of putting a fundamental mm -hmm. kind of Probably, I, I, don't, I don't know if this relation about the accuracy of the clock is something, this one here, purely quantum mechanical in the sense that it does not happen in, in classical physics. I don't know. I mean, if, if you imagine like a hand going on, like turning around in circles, you would need to put some energy to make it turn around in circles. make it lighter and lighter and lighter, uh -huh. it's going to have less and less energy, right? It's going to have less and less energy. Yes, yes, probably. Classically, it seems that I can Measure yes, I. I mean, if you if you would really model a classical clock with I don't know, Maxwell theory or something like that, yeah. I'm pretty sure you will run into certain problems of uh, 
in, in a certain limit, the clock will not actually show what the space-time interval along its world line is. I, I believe this, uh, you, you will run into some kind of contradiction of this sort. And, and the way we get out of this contradiction is, is by saying, okay, because this is, this is not an ideal clock. An ideal clock would, would really, um, we don't regard this as, as very important or fundamental. We say the metric exists, even though we cannot uh, measure it due to the fact that all clocks we can construct are uh, imperfect. Mm -hmm. But if we would have a perfect clock, it would actually measure this quantity. And we're happy with it because, because we regard this quantity as something that is actually there. And, and whatever failure we have to, to actually measure it is, is due to, I don't know, engineering uh, imperfections somehow. Like if you would put, I don't know, if you would have an accelerated trajectory, for example, and you use Maxwell theory to build a clock, then this clock would radiate, for example. No, you, 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 will, you will have certain problems if, if the clock is not following an inertial trajectory. I, I can imagine stuff like that, but... Uh, Sorry, I missed the beginning, so probably uh, my question isn't so interesting, but uh, so you were saying that there is this trade-off between the precision of the two clocks? Yes. But you are, one of them is a two-level atom or two-level system. Yes. But then, then when you are talking about the precision of measuring time, it's because you assume you make a measurement. But if you just let this two-level system evolve, in some sense there is no in, uh, inaccuracy in time, right? I mean, this thing is just <coughs> doing some rapid oscillation between the two levels. There is nothing special. With, so when you are saying that the time inaccuracy would be there because, just because you have in mind that you are, you are doing a measurement, isn't it? Yes, this is, this is related to, to, the, to the question of whether, whether you would regard uh, space-time as something that is already there and then I just have the problem that my clock is bad somehow. Um, so I think the, the point here is that uh, when one thinks about general relativity, what makes clocks tick or what, what the thing that actually whenever we talk about space-time trajectories and so on, we have in the back of our minds the metric field of, uh, of special... So, so when, when you say, okay, but I'm not measuring the clock, nevertheless the clock is evolving, we have, we have in the back of our minds that, that there is some fixed space-time in which the clock is evolving, meaning this, this clock is tracing a trajectory in, in space-time. And this image becomes maybe not so clear when the clock itself is affecting the metric of space-time, which is the very same thing that in, in which we can make sense precisely of what we mean by, by the passing of time itself. So, so, so I think when, when one starts putting general relativity as, a, as an important ingredient into these things, the, the, the whole, one, one starts messing really with the causal structure of, of uh, space-time and, and the whole picture becomes, uh, becomes uh, fuzzier somehow. If you would, for example, or, or put another way, uh, if, you, if you would say, okay, it is evolving in time, how do you, how do you know? Uh, well, I use the Schrodinger equation, I use I D D T, and then, and then I ask, what is D D T? And then you, you start getting into all of these uh, kind, of, uh, kind of problems. So, so you know, the text of clock yeah. makes sense of this evolution. So I guess he's not assuming the existence of Einstein. Is that correct? You're not assuming other clocks? For the moment, no. For the moment, no. Yeah. That's but the but this, this is really what this paper is about. I, I will talk about some sort of um, proposal in which you can in some way overcome this problem. Basically, why do you say that when the, two, when the gap between the two energy levels is small, you say your clock is less precise in its, in its measurement of time? Why, why do you say that? What is it? Because, because it takes longer for it to become orthogonal to the initial state, and therefore you, you cannot chop uh, the, the timeline, say, very, very thinly. <laughs> So you have this system which evolves between two orthogonal states with some uh, frequency. But then if I would like to use that as a clock, I should measure in plus or minus basis. And yes. I find the plus and the minus, etc. But if I don't measure at the right time, I move some more. Yeah, I yeah, this so I is I true. Need, yeah. I need a clock to know when to measure this clock to get the right result. So um. If you measure it very often, it will turn it. Yes, I, 
yeah, I, I think, uh, okay, so this is a problem that maybe can be overcome with uh, more energy levels, right? And, and then, so, yes. This is just, yeah, I think it is a problem if you want to do something a bit more realistic. This is just, uh, my aim here is not to build a clock in, in, in a very precise sense and, and make sense out of measuring time with a quantum system. It's merely saying that the fact that clocks are in the superposition of energies lead when you take it to the, to the extreme to a, uh, to a superposition of metric fields. And I want to focus on, on, on that. Of course, if, if one uh, is interested in uh, making sense of the idea of a clock as a, as a quantum mechanical system, this is a very interesting question and, and a very important one, I think. Um, one can ask questions as like, uh, can, the, can the clock uh, tick autonomously? Can, can, can it give me like classical bits of information without me having go, uh, to go and, and measure it, for example. And uh, it, gets very, it can get very complicated depending on what you mean by a clock and, and what you mean by measuring time. All I want to do here is, is to, uh, to talk about an example in which, uh, like a very concrete physical situation that leads to a superposition of metrics. This is my aim. And this can be done also by, by really take a piece of lead and, and, and put it in an interferometer and, and then you would get similar effect and similar complications. Uh, I don't know if uh, any other questions? Yeah, I think the general argument holds. I mean, a clock should not be in the eigenstate of its thermal obviously. So it's to be able to move there for So you have a but is this surprising at all? I mean it's been long known that classical chair doesn't work with quantum mechanics, so this is just a paradox like you can derive thousands of paradoxes when you usually try to combine the two but this is why people develop super string models. <coughs> well if you if you want, yes, yes. Uh, I, I wouldn't say they're incompatible, but, but there, is, uh, there are interesting problems that, that have to do with combining both of them. And, and this, is, this is an instance of, of uh, those problems that, uh, that have to do maybe not with uh, black holes, like uh, Planck scale, this is independent. It has not, nothing to do with the ability of defining a point in space-time, but rather with defining space-time operationally in terms of a grid of, of clocks, right? So, uh, so maybe, maybe it's not exactly the same type of argument that we are used to in, in say, uh, quantum gravity. It's, it's of a different flavor. But, um, but it's an argument that I want to use now here as a, as a motivation for why the problem I want to, I want to uh, treat is, is interesting. And, uh, well, okay, just this can be treated like, like uh, another way of saying this is that the clocks will get entangled due to the, their gravitational interaction. And, and one can model this by this very simple Newtonian Hamiltonian. And, uh, and one can actually compute at when is, the, is this clock no longer able to function as a clock uh, in terms of its purity when it gets entangled with the other clock. And um, of course, there, there, uh, there is a very important question. When I write down that Hamiltonian and I uh, 
describe the time evolution of these two clocks and they describe how do they get entangled to each other, this time evolution, this t in the time evolution, with respect to which clock is it defined, and so on. And, and then this is, this is more or less what the paper, what the paper is about. So I, I want to stress, yes? For the moment, for the moment, yes, but but there is clearly a tension in 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 this assumption because because when when you say okay, I'm going to write down the Schrödinger equation, you are in some sense assuming a fixed uh, space time. So this is uh, so th this is kind of the key point of of uh, the paper somehow. Can you can you reach the Schrödinger evolution or can you? Uh, build a framework in which the Schrodinger evolution with respect to a clock appears naturally without having to assume that you have a fixed metric. And if so, what is the difference between having a, fix, a fixed metric and not having one? And this is what I will explain uh, afterwards. So when you say the right one, you mean you have to use a different evolution equation from the Schrodinger equation and you get Schrodinger equation as a special case? Is that no, you, you, you will see. You, you use some sort of... Um, this has to do, I don't, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with uh, the timeless approach to quantum mechanics or the Page and Wooters approach to quantum mechanics. This has to do with that. This has to do with, um, with defining time really as um, correlations between a clock and a system, so to speak. It's, it's, uh, so, so this is, now I'm going to talk about really what the paper is about. The, 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 the previous slides were only motivation. And now, um, I don't know how much time I have uh, left, <laughs> like 15 minutes or something like that. I, I want to, to then give you the kind of main flavor of, of, the, of the result before I, I kind of jump into the specific cases that we treat. So, so the main idea is um, clearly there is something going on here with the, with the concepts of event and its localization. And there, there is clearly a problem with localizing events um, in cases where we don't have a fixed metric. This paper is about a proposal to do so even in the absence of, of a fixed metric. And um, it has several different... Um, it is in contrast with, with the usual situation that we have when we, when we uh, don't have quantum systems that gravitate. Um, maybe the main, the, main import, the, the, the main difference is that we are able to localize events in time, but only in a certain reference frame. So this generalizes a bit the idea of defining time with respect to a clock. What we have when we, when we have a fixed metric in general relativity, we are always allowed to choose a given clock to parameterize the time evolution of systems and to parameterize the events that we have. So we can choose this clock that goes along this word line and we will see events happening along this word line and this word line will somehow induce a foliation in space time in which we can put other events. And by using this clock or this time frame, we will be able to look at other events, and these other events will look as points in space-time. This is the usual picture of localization of events when we have a fixed metric. The main difference now that I want to talk about is here we will be able to jump from one clock to another and define events along the world line of a given clock or another. The difference is that now when we jump to a clock, we will see that all the events that are in the world line of this clock are somehow well localized. We will look at them as points. But when we try to look from these same reference frames at events that are far apart from this, we will see that the localization of events, other events in time, will be spread out. This is probably the, the, most, um, the most significant kind of, uh, I don't know, phenomenological, I don't know how to call it, difference between cases where you have a fixed metric and where you don't. When you don't have a fixed metric, the concept of localizability in time of an event becomes a relative concept. And uh, maybe this is the main, one of the main points, or, or if you want to look at it the other way, maybe on the positive side, uh, 
you would expect that everything is delocalized because you don't have a fixed uh, metric, but you can always, for a given event, find a reference frame in which you can apply your quantum mechanical intuition and the Schrodinger equation makes sense and the purification of CP maps makes sense and so on. At the, at the expense, of course, of having events which are delocalized. But I, I'm, I'm getting a bit ahead. So, so how do we do this? What is the kind of mathematical framework? I don't want to stress probably the equations very much. Maybe this, this idea is, is the main thing I want to transmit is this relativity of localization and the ability to jump into a frame where things look good. Um, now I will discuss the, the, how we do it and how we, how we frame the, the, the problem. So I don't know, are you familiar with this timeless approach, Paige Wooters? Uh, approach to quantum mechanics. The main idea is very simple. I don't know if, can I write here? Maybe here, huh? because otherwise not everybody will. No, it's fine, it's fine. Oh. <laughs> Maybe it's easier if I... I mean, it's a bit of a trick, but uh, I will do it so that maybe it's... Usually, we're used to this, no? Where we have uh, some T, and this T is some sort of abstract thing that is not dynamical, does not possess any, any type of... Uh, Hamiltonian or anything like that. The patient waters basically what it does in, the, in its e easiest or its simplest uh, form is to start with an equation that looks instead of like this, that looks like this, some total say Hamiltonian acting on some state equals zero. And this guy, they call it the Hamiltonian of the system and the Hamiltonian of the clock. So now the clock is promoted to a dynamical system with its own Hilbert space, etc. And not only the system uh, is, uh, is playing a role as, as a quantum object. And then um, there are many possible representations of what this is. Perhaps the simplest one, at least for the clock, is one in which we have this sort of algebra. This means, this represents the hand of the clock where we are measuring time. Uh, and this is somehow the momentum or the, the Hamiltonian of the clock, the thing that makes the clock tick. So if one, if one imposes this, one can derive this equation from this. So at least this is more general than this. So this is a cyclic clock, I guess, right? It should be. Because of Pauli's argument, you cannot H is unbounded, so T cannot be from minus infinity. Okay, so Pauli's argument is, uh, has to do with this. Pauli's argument was more like, if you use a clock in this, uh, in this same space of the system, then you cannot have it uh, bounded. But, but, but it's true that this is unbounded. It's true that this is unbounded, and, and then, strictly speaking, this is an idealization. I, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just presenting it like this because it's easier. But you see that TC, TC is kind of a position of the arrow? Yeah. HC is kind of a momentum? Yes. So then it's unbounded on, from both sides? Oh, from both sides, yes. Kind of time, uh, no, it's not an amateur, so time can go from minus to plus infinity, which is fine. Oh, I mean, yeah. HC is not a <laughs> kind of it's fine. It's not a kind of time, yeah. But there are two approaches, one in which it is a kind of time. Uh, like in the original page, Luther's, it was a kind of time, positive. Yeah. And you uh, can also see it as a kind of constraint on this abstract thing. Which you define first as a momentum, but then HT psi equals zero is in fact a constraint on your uh, physical space. Anyway. I mean, the, the important thing about this is, is in this C Hilbert space, if you take any state in this Hilbert space and then act with this and then bra with this, what you will get is. Right? Where this is 
where this is that, right? And then, and then this is the crucial uh, thing that, you, that we will use here. So simply bra this with some t of the clock, and this will imply that minus i d in dt psi of the system plus h of the system psi of the systems equals zero, where this guy is just t capital psi, where capital psi is this one. So this is just the Schrodinger equation. Uh, okay, I, 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 I do this because I think it's, it's, uh, this is what this framework is about. Of course, one can uh, propose more elaborate uh, Hamiltonians here, where clocks can interact and so on. And, and one can ask what happens to the um, Schrodinger equation. How would it look like with respect to one or the other clock? Or one can um, ask the question, what if I, to make it more GR friendly, what if I don't have just one clock but several? And, and, and these several are located at different positions and suffer therefore from different time dilation factors. How would time evolution look from one to, uh, and, and from the other? How can I change from one to the other reference frame? And this is what the paper is about. Um, so this slide is, is basically now irrelevant because, because I explained to you this here. Perhaps something mathematically, if you do something like this, where this is this total Hamiltonian, and you apply it in any clock, in, in any state of a Hilbert space, you will obtain a solution of that equation. It's like you're averaging over all, all possible group actions, and therefore you obtain uh, a solution to that. And this is useful, and this, this uh, technique was, was useful to us to, to obtain several uh, to, to basically to learn how to change from one clock to the other. So this here is the idea. You have several clocks, clocks. You have a system that you want to describe somehow. And then you have a notion of jumping into one of the clocks and describing the physics with respect to the clock. And by the physics with respect to the clock, I mean expressing this state psi as something like this, where we have the time that the clock is showing and the state of the rest of the world, namely here in this case, C1, C2, C4, and S, at that time. And uh, importantly, this, the, the, the evolution of the rest of the system will be unitary when we jump to a clock. And... Um, Does the state involve the other clocks? So the three bar means... Everything. Three bar means everything that is not three, yes. So including the other clocks? Including the other clocks, exactly. Including the other clocks. Yeah, this is important. Or, and what, what we derived was, was uh, some transformation laws from this representation, where, where th the clock three is the clock that, that uh, describes the evolution, to the situation where the clock two describes the evolution. It's the same state, it's the same physics, it's just parameterized by a different time parameter. And what we were interested in is to, to see, when we do this change, what happens to the notion of event, what happens to the localization of events in a way that, that uh, I, I, will, I will tell you how we defined, and, uh, and we found what I told you that we found. And this is a bit maybe counterintuitive in, in, uh, if one thinks about what I was saying before, that the clocks get entangled and then I, I will not be able to use this guy as a clock because it will be in a pure, in a mixed state, and then it will not tick uh, correctly. And then, um, so what if these clocks get entangled? Can, can our approach um, describe entanglement between clocks? And how come I told you that the evolution with respect to a clock, when we jump into it, is unitary? And before I told you that the clocks get entangled and therefore one of the clocks is in a mixed state. There seems to be a contradiction here, or, or tension at least. And this is, this is important in order to get, uh, to resolve this tension, in order to get some intuition about quantum reference frames. So these clocks are an example of a quantum reference frame for time. 
that is a reference frame that instead of relying on a classical system to, to, as, as a reference, it relies on a quantum system as a reference. And there are different things when uh, one uses, there, there are different effects, different phenomena that happen when one uses a quantum system as a reference frame as opposed to a classical system as a reference frame. So I'm going to now make a bit of a digression to, to clarify this issue. And I will, uh, I will talk about quantum reference frames for space. And uh, the, the main point or the main, the main thing that solves this apparent contradiction is the fact that when I say a clock is entangled or is in a mixed state, I have to say always with respect to which reference frame. And when we talk about quantum reference frames, a system can be entangled or not entangled depending on the reference frame. So, so the entanglement and superpositions are relative notions when one treats, uh, when one describes uh, physics from the point of view of, of quantum reference frames. And this is an example that illustrates that. Suppose you have Alice and Bob, so Alice is blue and Bob is uh, red. Suppose, and I'm Charlie, suppose Charlie writes this state here. It's an entangled state between the two, and it's an entangled state such that it's a sum of two amplitudes, and in each amplitude, the relative distance between Alice and Bob is the same, it's delta. And then you can ask the question, if I were Alice, how would I describe Bob? So naively, one could say, okay, this is an entangled state, therefore, Bob's state is mixed. And then, then I could trace out Alice, and then I, Alice, Alice would say, okay, Bob, you're in a mixed state. But this is not quite the case. If one thinks a bit, a bit more closely about the problem, one would see that because for every two, each of the two amplitudes, the distance between Bob and Alice is exactly the same, and Alice has all the right to say, okay, I am located at, at, at position, say, zero, the description of Alice uh, would be that Bob is in a pure state given by this uh, delta specific. Uh, and th this, is, this is an analogy to what, was, uh, to what uh, I was saying in the sense of when I say how would clock two describe the physics, even if clock two is entangled with clock, I don't know, four or five from the point of view of another clock, when I jump into the reference frame of clock two, clock two says, okay, no, I, I'm, I'm not entangled. I'm, I am to totally entitled to describe a normal unitary evolution. I, I see that the state is pure and remains pure with respect to my reference frame. So this is a bit counterintuitive, but it's perhaps uh, the, the, the most important um, result of our work, namely that, that even if you have clocks that are interacting with each other or, or more, um, more GR, even if, if the metric is not fixed and this, and this causes entanglement between the clocks, you can always jump into the reference frame of a clock where the dynamics will look unitary. But of course, it's not only about the dynamics, it's about, um, I don't know, events or what happens to events. So here is the physical picture that we have. We're, we're interested in uh, kind of mapping the points of events into, into a manifold that we call space-time somehow. So this is a way in which, in, in which one can do it. Suppose for, for uh, in the beginning that the metric is fixed, suppose that the clocks don't interact with each other, there, is no significant, uh, there are no significant gravitational effects or anything like that. Suppose we have Alice and Bob, they both uh, have a system or, or a part of a system that can be entangled. They have an ancilla, they have a clock, and then they program their clock to trigger an interaction between the system and the ancilla, interaction with, which will become, for example, a measurement because they will get entangled and then the ancilla will record some information about the system, and then they will measure something at the end, and by, by repeating the experiment many, many times, they will uh, have an idea of when the event happened. And by event, me, I mean, when the interaction between the system and the ancilla was triggered. So they can, they can for example, uh, do map the events in space-time into something that looks like this. So I, I forgot to say, so this, this Hamiltonian or this constraint means these are the Hamiltonians for the clocks, the things that make the clocks tick, and these Fs are the things that um, trigger an interaction between the clock and the ancilla. So if we want to trigger an interaction that is very sharp in time, for example, this, this F will have, will have the form, uh, oof. 
say f of ta will typically have a form that looks like So it's a delta function. This is an operator. And then some operator that makes interact the system and the ancilla of A. So this means when Alice's clock shows TA, I trigger an interaction between the system and the ancilla. And this is how I define an event. And by doing this many, many times, I can, I can map the events into space time. And this is an example of how this can be done for, for a classical say metric, and we can see that we can do it either with respect to Alice's clock, which is this clock on the left, or with respect to Bob's clock, which is this clock on the right. And both will trace some sort of time surfaces, equal time surfaces, which will in general be different to each other. But as long as the metric is fixed, both of them will talk about the events as uh, fixed stars in this manifold. And this will be the key difference between having a fixed metric or not having one. These stars will, in general, not be fixed. OK, so this is just what I told you. This is, I, I don't want to get a lot into the mathematical details, but ba basically, this is how you can solve the equation. And um, OK, OK, this is important. You solve the equation. This is a solution to this equation. This equation describes two clocks, Alice and Bob, and each of these clocks defines their own event in their own, say, reference frame or something like that. And then we want to find what Psi is, because Psi contains, say, the history of the, of the system. The, the history of events is contained in this Psi. We solve it and we obtain this. We can solve it in many ways and with respect to many reference frames. Here, in particular, I chose to solve it with respect to Alice. So as you see, I, I have the time of Alice and then a unitary operator that acts on an initial state. So this unitary operator will be the evolution, the time evolution operator in Alice's reference frame. And I can ask the question, how do events look like in Alice's reference frame? And I can ask the question, how um, would Bob describe things, how I can transform from Alice to Bob? So. All of this is uh, irrelevant except for this f, which is, uh, as I told you, the function that, that tells me when the event happens. So the, the key point here is that when we solve the equation and we look at f in Alice's perspective, we see that the argument of f is parameterized by, by s, which is a c number. It's a, it's a real number that goes from, say, 0 to ta for a fixed ta. This means that. If, um, if this TA star, which is, which is the time at which the event happens with respect to Alice, is in this interval, then the event will happen sharply at this time, and that's it. On the other hand, if we look at how this fun the function that parameterizes when the event happens, the event that, that was triggered by Bob happens, we see that it does not only depend on S, which is a C number, but rather it depends on an operator. So this means that if for some reason this TB has some quantum fluctuations, has some uncertainty, there will be some uncertainty as to when the event is applied or when the event happens in Alice's reference frame. So Alice sees her event always fixed in time, sharply happening in time, whereas, Bob will, uh, where, whereas uh, Bob's event will be in general uh, fuzzy, say. This is, this is uh, exemplified here. If we are in Alice's reference frame, her event, meaning the entanglement between the system and the ancilla, will be sharp whenever uh, she uh, set the event to happen. But if for some reason, and I'm cheating here, like artificially I will prepare a bad clock, so Alice will see that Bob starts his clock in a, with, with a finite uh, width, with, a, with an intrinsic inaccuracy. And this inaccuracy will lead to the unsharp definition of Bob's event in Alice's reference frame. This is natural. I mean, if, if the clock is not very accurate, then of course the, uh, it will trigger the event at different times defined with respect to another clock which is very accurate. So this is what Alice will see. Alice will see that Bob's event is spread out in time 
with uh, a typical spread that is uh, characterized by the width of the wave packet in her reference frame. Is there any limitation on sigma here because you have no gravity here, right? Or yes, exactly. So, so this is an artificial example in, in which I chose uh, sigma to be uh, finite. But it could be zero too. It could be zero too. It could be zero too, in which case both guys will define very sharp events in both reference frames. And crucially, this, we can do this because the clocks are not interacting. So I'm, I'm, I'm cheating now, so just to give you a flavor of, of uh, how the formalism works. And I will stop cheating. I will say, OK, both clocks can, in principle, be prepared with uh, infinite accuracy, with sigma as small as you want. But they're interacting. There is gravity. What will happen then? It, will, will, there, uh, will this lead to, to a time uncertainty of events or not? And OK, so as, as I told you, we, we can look at this situation either from the perspective of Alice or from the perspective of Bob. And if we jump into Bob's reference frame, the whole game gets, uh, gets reversed. And then Bob will describe his event by a C number, namely his event is sharp in his clock, whereas Alice's event is unsharp in Bob's clock. Now this is gravity. This is we have, say, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. I put Charlie for, uh, I don't know, it's easier. And, uh, and Alice and Bob interact gravitationally. And, they, and say Alice wants to define an event happening at a certain time. And this is because, well, defining an event costs some energy. So I have to put for consistency um, the fact, include the fact that energy gravitates as well. OK, this is very ugly. I, I don't want to, uh, don't pay a lot of attention to this. The, what, what, what this is, is you solve the equation and you ask, what is the evolution of operator with respect to Charlie? So Charlie is not interacting with anybody. Charlie is just a far away, say, uh, spectator that would like to describe the situation in his frame. So because Charlie is not interacting with anybody, there's no problem with, with his uh, the flow of time in his reference frame. And then Charlie asks the question, is Alice's event sharp in my time or not? And in order to answer this question, Charlie looks as, at this function, which is the function that defines when the event happened. And as we see, this function depends on two operators. One is TA, like in the case we had before, which, which uh, as we said, if we believe that Alice can prepare an initial clock wave packet that is extremely sharp, this TA can be neglected. This is, this is say, the clock is intrinsically bad. And, and we believe that we can, as an approximation, make clocks that are, uh, for all practical purposes, perfect. But this is not the only operator on which this uh, function depends. Rather, it also depends on HB. HB is the um, energy of B's clock. This means that. If B's clock is, uh, is heavy, this HB will have a very large, uh, th th this will have a very large, uh, say, uh, influence on the passing of time with respect to Alice. It will generate time dilation. This is a time dilation factor. This lambda is uh, minus G over C to the fourth times the distance between Alice and, and Bob. But mo most importantly, what this says is that if this is uncertain in time, then the time of application of the operation of Alice in Charlie's reference frame will also be uncertain in time. And this is, of course, uncertain in time. Uh, uncertain. This is, of course, uncertain in, 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 in energy because this system is a clock. So this system cannot be in a sharp state of energy. Otherwise, it would not tick. So by the mere fact that, that we're using this system as a clock, we have necessarily some width associated to this, uh, to this wave packet. And therefore, we have necessarily some uh, uncertainty as to when the event happens in Charlie's reference frame. So this is, this is depicting this. Suppose that Bob's wave packet initially is prepared with an uncertainty sigma in time. This means Bob can measure time up to this uh, uncertainty. What would this, if, if Alice and Bob are interacting gravitationally, what would this uncertainty mean in terms of the uh, ability of Alice to define 
are sharply, uh, an event which looked sharp in time for Charlie. And then because of time uncertainty, because of the time uncertainty relation, the width in, in uh, the, how fuzzy Alice's event is will depend on one over sigma. Because of course is, uh, is the variance of the energy is one over sigma if the variance of the, of the time of Bob is, is sigma. So this means the more accurate Bob clock uh, is, the larger its influence, its gravitational influence on Alice, and the more difficult it will be for Alice to have an event which is sharply defined in time in Charlie's reference frame. This is, of course, complicated and counterintuitive. This is not what we mean by an event in, in, in GR, right? Because an event in GR looks like a point, and this, this is clearly not a point. This is some sort of coherent superposition of, of amplitudes happening, and happening at different time with respect to a clock. So this is, this is perhaps the most, uh, the newest feature that, that we're proposing that will happen in general whenever you have indefinite metrics and you define events operationally as, as, as stuff that happens to, to physical systems. In general, the notion of whether an event is localized or localizable will be, uh, will be relative. Relative because this is from the perspective of Charlie. If we solve the same equation from the perspective of Alice, I can tell you how to do it, but I, I don't want uh, to, to, because it's technical, but we can discuss if you want. If you jump into the reference frame of Alice, it turns out that the evolution operator takes this very simple form in which the argument of F, namely the, the thing that tells us whether the event is localized in time or not, is given by a C number, meaning when S equals to TA, the event happens sharply. So. We have the same event, the same physics. It is spread all over in time when we measure time with respect to Charlie's clock, but it is um, very, very sharply localized when we use Alice's clock to measure time. This means Alice's clock is a very uh, convenient reference frame, quantum time reference frame, to talk about this event. So it is as if we would have our usual intuition of quantum mechanics, but applying specifically for, for, for specific events. For each event, we can choose a reference frame in which the time evolution looks like this. And this is nothing but the, say, von Neumann uh, model of a measurement. This is, this is the uh, unitary dilation of, of a CP map, if you want. So, and and this, is, this is our usual quantum mechanical picture. So we can always choose a reference frame such that for a given event, not for all events, for, but for a given event, we can use our usual uh, quantum mechanical pictures. And uh, I don't know if I... Uh, sorry, sorry, what about Bob's uh, events from Alice's point of view? So first you said from... Yeah. Point of view, we have two it, so it will look fuzzy as well from, from Bob's. Yeah. And yeah. Like the red thing. Yes, yes, yes. It, it will be even more complicated because it, it will have to do with whether Alice measures spin up or spin down and so on, because it, the, this, function, this function will appear in, uh, importantly. It's, it, it, it's more complicated. Yeah. But, uh, but in general, it will be fuzzy in time as well. And maybe to discuss the last example, um, I don't know, or I, do you, shall we? I, the, the, this is the main message that I wanted to transmit. This is yet another example, maybe, maybe the most important. Uh, so consider now a very binary situation in which time goes slow on the left and fast on the right in a superposition with the other. Uh, then one, instead of the, let me go back very like a lot. Instead of this picture where the stars are sharply localized and we have just a plane, what we are suggesting is that there are situations involving masses that gravitate that would lead to a different picture in which we, instead of having just one, say, manifold in which we draw uh, stars as events, we will have two for the two different amplitudes of the gravitational field. And in these two different amplitudes, we will have uh, in one reference frame that an event happens always at the same time, meaning we, we rotate, say, we make a change of quantum reference frame rotating this, uh, this axis such that an event is always localized in time, 
but we can also uh, look at things from another reference frame with derotate or something like that. This would be Charlie, where the events are, are actually not seen as uh, corresponding to the same time, but corresponding to different time for the different amplitudes of, of uh, where, say, the piece of lead is. And uh, well, uh, yeah, thank you. I think this is <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. There are certainly these Lorentz uh, transformations and so on maybe related to that. Not, not necessarily the page Wooters, but one can look at this from the point of view of quantum reference frames as well, in the sense of one can have a quantum reference frame transformation in which I am jumping to, to a quantum system which is not Lorentz boosted by a certain velocity, but is Lorentz boosted by a superposition of velocities. Something like that, and and one can. It, it, I think there's something interesting to be understood there. Um, it's it's important for. Uh, we wrote a paper about the definition of what we mean by spin in special relativity, and and this notion pops out uh, when when you want to kind of try to define what spin. I, this is not your question, of course, but uh, I, I want to say that uh, in principle, it's it's an open. Uh, field or an, an, an open area in, in which one can think of also quantum reference frames where, where the group is, is the Poincaré or Lorentz group, yeah, which is interesting. I don't know if, uh, whereas uh, Page Wooters for QFT, I've never seen anything in the literature where, where they have done this, but in principle, I don't, uh, I don't see any, anything that prevents one from doing that. In some sense, Page and Wooters is, uh, can be, every, every theory that you want can be trivially made, put in the Page and Wooters sense. Instead of writing IH DDT equals H Psi, you just pass everything to, the, to one side and equally equate it to zero and, and convert the DDT into an operator and that's it. But, uh, okay. yeah, so we can discuss this later. Yeah, yeah I, I have the feeling I didn't uh, answer what you were, what you were yeah, talking about. But, okay. This, this is kind of the context in which we uh, want to kind of uh, play, of course, yeah. So yeah, like this, this kind of experiments that, that want to, at the moment, as far as I know, nobody has done an experiment in which the gravitational field sourced by a quantum uh, object is uh, significant uh, and, and, and measured. But there are many, uh, there are many proposals for doing that, and there are many, uh, it's, it's an active field of, of uh, experimental research now, yeah. uh, of, of really putting a mass in a quantum superposition and see what happens, no? There, there's an argument of uh, whether this, this could, could test whether gravity is quantum, for example, and, and, and there, there are some interesting discussions about. And are there competing uh, explanations, not explanations, competing predictions, like which are contradicting? So like, so when you have a certain set of predictions, then certain things should be. The, there are models, there are models that, that postulate that, that one cannot do that and that, that, uh, that there will be some sort of uh, once you reach a certain mass threshold, these are called collapse models, and you put something in a superposition, then, then the superposition principle of quantum mechanics will break down, no? Okay. There, so this is of course very, uh, I don't know, not many people believe this, but, but there are these, uh, but yeah, in, in my opinion, 
I don't know, one should focus on, on more kind of experimental predictions of, of that sort. This is why we focus on, for example, the notion of events and one can, in principle, think of an experiment that, that monitors when the events happen and so on. Something I didn't mention, but happens also, is that, for example, here you get, when, when Alice describes Bob's and Charlie's clock, you get some modification to the Hamiltonian of Bob and Charlie as seen by Alice that is given by this. This is nothing but, but the blue shift of the, of the energies. And this, of course, in principle can be measured if you increase or decrease the distances between. And then you see that, okay, your clock is ticking faster or your clock is ticking slower because I'm... Uh, so this, is, this in principle can be, this is not necessarily a quantum effect. This is more like a classical, but, but can, be, can be measured too, I think. 